Good evening. Hello, everybody. Nice to see a lot of people signed in here. Um, a few familiar faces for sure. Um, I am, have the pleasure of introducing John. I think we're going to find his topic very interesting and uh, he's got a plethora of information for us to digest. Um, John is the executive director of Trees for the Future and the author of the Nautilus award-winning book, One Shot, Trees is Our Last Chance for Survival. John found his passion for agroforestry while serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa and has since committed his life to helping people rise above hunger and poverty. Through his work, John has learned how to speak a few languages well and a few not so well. More, more importantly, his work directly with thousands of farmers to plant over 200 million trees, which I think we all can appreciate is an impressive number. Um, John, without further ado, why don't you jump into the program? Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you, Allison. It's, it's, I'm honored to be here this evening. Thank you so much. It's great to see so many people logging in to join us here this evening. So it's, it's my great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me just fine. I'm from Tremendous, Maryland. I'm happy to, I was born in DC, but grew up in Maryland. And I did, I joined the Peace Corps and it was in the Peace Corps when I first started volunteering at the end of my service for Trees for the Future. I had first learned about Trees for the Future. I had first met the, the founder of the organization and we were just getting started. The organization uh, was, was starting to plant some trees, but we since then have, have grown the organization quite a bit. Um, we've planted over 200 million trees with communities around the world. And with your help and the help of many other people and businesses and organizations and partners, we're gonna plant another 50 million trees this year alone. So it's taken us 30 years to plant our first 200 million and we're gonna plant another 50 million this year. So we're super excited. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and jump into um, the presentation here this evening. We can't hear you. John, we're still not hearing you. You're not muted, but we lost your audio. How about now? Now we can hear you. Oh, that was a scare, everybody. I tell you, that was a big scare. <laughs> we'll try this again, though. Can you still hear me? And we got some visuals. All right, audio and visual. Let's get into it. Uh, there's a lot more to tree planting than just planting trees. Uh, as uh, an organization, we're an international nonprofit. Uh, we have a mission to end hunger, poverty, and deforestation in rural communities around the world. And the program I get to explain today uh, is now not just planting all of those millions of trees, but we're helping over 150,000 people through the program and restoring over 30,000 now. I see 26 on the screen here. The numbers are coming in every single day. We're over 30,000 acres. Um, and we used to work in, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, but in the recent years, we've been focusing specifically in Africa, uh, where our forest garden program, and here's a forest garden in the background that you see right here, is ending hunger, it's ending poverty, and it's restoring the environment. I had the great pleasure of working with our founder, Dave Deppner, who has passed many years ago, uh, but here I took this picture of him with Nobel laureate Wangari Maathai. And so Wangari Maathai was a wonderful uh, activist on behalf of trees and tree planting in Kenya and our organizations and the women's green belt movement have worked together a lot over the years. What I get to describe here this evening has benefited from some of the smartest 
projects and mines in tree planting. We talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. I've had the great pleasure of working with people who have planted a tremendous number of millions of trees in their lives and learned a lot about how to do it well and how to do it sustainably. The organization was founded in 1989 in Dave's basement in Wheaton, Maryland. So not terribly far from where we're all here right now. Today, it's grown into a much larger organization at our Silver Spring office. We've got 20 employees. We have 200 field staff in Africa. And um, through that, we have uh, so many followers online and uh, people helping us. It's good to start the presentation with just a little bit of the talk about deforestation and the problem. Um, as we look at this uh, map here, which uh, is, was generated from WRI, the World Resources Institute, you can kind of see drivers of deforestation. Why are we losing our trees around the world? And as we look in Africa in the middle, you'll see there's a lot of yellow there and it's different in Latin America and in Southeast Asia, you see the drivers of deforestation are a little different. Certainly in Southeast Asia, you see uh, commodity driven deforestation. If we look in our shampoo, if we look in a lot of products we have and you see palm oil written there, um, it's very likely that that palm oil was grown in ways that's destroying you know, entire forests in, in that region. Uh, a lot of the consumption and the um, uh, extraction and, uh, and, and deforestation is happening there. And similarly, in, um, well, I guess the Amazon's a little different, but it is very much agribusinesses, big agribusinesses that are driving that deforestation, driving a lot of the deforestation in South America, as you see. But South America has a little bit of the yellow mixed in and Africa is almost entirely, and that's because it's smallholder farmers. So it's still agriculture, chipping away at our forest, clearing the land. Um, but it's not big businesses. It's usually not the commodity driven deforestation. This is smallholder farmers. It's hundreds of millions of families who are chronically food insecure, who are struggling to feed themselves year after year and driven with really short term farming practices. Every year they're clearing the land, they're planting a monocrop. If they can get some fertilizer, they'll They'll try to get something like that. And each year there's, there's less and less production. The soil is eroding. Uh, the watersheds are, driving, are drying up. And these are the same communities who are at most risk of, of climate change. Our solution, the forest garden approach and planting forest gardens that I get to explain in a lot of detail this evening um, is one that is benefiting the local environment and the global environment. It's serving as a source of reliable nutrition and income for families. And it's also, it's, it's taking a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere and it's helping the global environment in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about biodiversity and look at a lot of the other beneficial techniques. Uh, the, the people who join our program are earning less than a dollar a day. They're usually monocrop farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and our approach is a forest garden approach. It's a four year training program that takes up very degraded plot of land like what's behind our friend Moore Loom here. And over the course of a few years uses good ideas in tree planting to transform a very degraded plot of land into essentially a living grocery store. Uh, trees for us are the key anchor in the community. It's a key entry point. Um, and through this, we're able to reach so many more people. We've got 30,000 families in the program now. And I mentioned we have a, the training program that we walk them through. Uh, we're delivering field-based training. And we also provide essential seeds and essential materials to all of the families that join our program. We prioritize our program in East and West Africa. You'll see a map here soon where communities are struggling, they're food insecure, they're they're suffering from, from chronic hunger. Um, the environment is highly degraded and uh, um, they bring the land, they bring the labor, they bring the enthusiasm, um, they, they go through our program. And now our graduates, here we are five, six later, years later, are forming cooperatives. They're accessing markets, they're rising above hunger and above poverty. So our training program, uh, I've got 200 employees and we have a lot of organizations that we're working with nowadays. Our training program is kind of like college for farmers who never got to step foot inside a school before. 
Uh, all of our farmers are low literate. Uh, they have not had the, most have not had the chance to um, e either either start or, or complete school, um, but it's field-based and it's, it's active and we're able to do it in a way that's engaging and it brings out the expertise of all of our farmers. They've been farming for 10, 20, 30, you know, more years and they have a tremendous amount of expertise. We're able to extract that out and bring all the new ideas in agroforestry. So you won't be able to read the tiny words across the bottom here, but there's kind of a one, two, three that we walk all our farmers through. And this works for any farmer anywhere who wants to optimize their farm in a sustainable way. And the first thing we do is we have a protection phase. So it's protect, diversify, and optimize. So protection phase means we map out the land. When I say map, I mean, we draw it out on a piece of paper. We look at, at what some of the features are and we'll plant a hedge around it that's gonna keep the goats out. It's gonna keep other things out. Um, and, and I'm gonna show you some, some living fences and other ways that we plant trees to keep, it, keep and protect the field. Um, then we diversify what farmers are growing. They're growing, we add fruit trees and vegetables and, and train farmers to grow all sorts of wonderful things to sell or to eat. Um, and before we're done, each family has learned a lot of different growing techniques and mulch and ways to conserve the water and improve the soil and use the entire space so that the entire uh, farm is fully optimized. All of our uh, 30,000 families all go through the workshops. They all learn how to grow their own seedlings. Uh, we budget for each family to be able to produce 4,000 seedlings to grow their forest garden. And they're gonna learn at least a dozen or two dozen new types of food crops integrated into it. So we go through a design phase, they grow seedlings of useful species. And the first phase that I mentioned is planting this living fence around the field. And what this is gonna do by the second year, fast growing thorny things, acacia species, for example, is they're gonna form a thick barrier and the goats can no longer get in, the roaming cattle can no longer get in, the field is going to be a lot more protected, and what we're trying to oh, and this is even this is even more robust. Um, sometimes it's two or three rows of different types of trees together, kind of like how we might see a, a, a blackberry uh, bushes around a field to protect it. They're thorny. They're going to keep some animals out. And they're going to give you fruit and berries and other things. So within the protection, and this is a great picture here from up above. Within the protection of that thorny hedge, that thorny living fence around the side, we train farmers to grow fruit trees and permagardens. And so this beautiful forest garden here, you can see the thorny uh, green wall all around the side of it. Uh, you can see the fruit trees throughout. There's a permagarden within it. And the farmers who graduate our program, um, we've graduated thousands out of the program already, and we have another thousands who are still in the program. Um, all forest gardens are gonna look a little different, but each forest garden has a green wall around it, protecting it. It's got fruit trees um, within the field. There's multi-purpose rows, either contour rows or other types of windbreaks, and there's a permagarden. Now, we got into this because we love trees and we were tree planting and we were finding ways to plant trees with communities that would, that would benefit in different ways. When we, created the forest garden approach, we put all of our best ideas into one package. And these are just charts. And these charts are all doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, the, foods, the food insecurity is supposed to be going down. The dietary diversity is supposed to be going up. We've collected over 10 million data points, not just on the trees and their survival, but on the socioeconomic impacts on people and families when they're trained to grow diverse forest gardens. And the data has just been absolutely incredible. So the big punchline here is that within two years, we can help all of the families in the program become food secure. It means they're not cutting back on meals. They're not skipping meals. They're not eating things they wish they didn't have to eat. They're not going to bed hungry. They've got not just one thing to eat, but lots of different types of things and all the nutritional groups are accounted for. And we're able to do this within two years. You saw the degraded plot of land that we started with. 
And from there, we get into the grocery store. Um, so it's, it's very impactful for families, especially for families for whom they have first generation students who are just starting to go to school. Um, and not only is it such an impact socioeconomically, but environmentally, and this is a drone shot, this is just one year. This is just one year uh, before and after. And we didn't get 2020 because of COVID, but this is 2018 and 2019 in Senegal. And you can see on the left side, that's just the, the wooden fence around the edge is just a stick fence. That's all you see. And you can see they've started to plant some rows of some different things in there. And on the right side, that's a year. You see rows of nitrogen fixing trees spanning across the field. You see patches of permagardens starting to grow. That's just one year. Uh, our average forest garden is about two acres in size and sequesters over 60 tons of carbon throughout its life. Um, and in places where it rains a lot more, there's a lot more carbon sequestration. Our programs are operating right now in nine countries. Um, you see the five here highlighted are a bit where we're focusing the most and, and building the biggest programs, but we're helping other organizations. We're very proud to be helping the International Rescue Committee in the Central African Republic, right in the middle of the continent there uh, for, for refugees, people post-conflict, conflict situations, planting forest gardens to diversify sources of income and nutrition are absolutely essential for so many people. Um, in other places, we're either working for environmental conservation or we're helping out with water projects that are trying to make their water projects sustainable as well. Applying forest gardens and, uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly beneficial in, in so many different ways. Our plans for the next few years, we're gonna keep growing. Um, we're, 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 we were at 50 million trees there. You can see the, the dot on the line there was just shy of 50 for 2021, but we're gonna exceed that this year. We're still looking into the crystal ball to see how much more we can grow and how many more we can plant in the next year, but we invite everybody's participation and appreciate your support. I think the fascinating discussion that I'm hoping to, to, to get into here in a little while um, starts. I'm sure you, you're, you have so many questions here. I want to run through a handful of slides that start to think about lessons to bring home. So we just kind of looked at pictures in East and West Africa. We looked at tropical farming systems and agroforestry where things grow a lot faster than anything here in Montgomery County or in Maryland. Um, but because of that, we are able to learn from the cropping systems and from African farmers because they're able to innovate and move and change so much faster. Trees grow three to five times faster. We're able to test all kinds of different ideas and we've been putting, together, putting them all together in our forest garden approach. So there's probably three main themes um, that we could walk through and uh, well, just before we do, I'll say the way that these, uh, some of these themes are, are, are unpacked a lot more in my book, One Shot. So all proceeds of the book, One Shot, go to trees for the future and plant more trees. And as we look at converting destructive farming systems into using agroforestry, into more regenerative, not only do we see that we can restore the agricultural lands themselves and the soil and the water, but we can begin to reverse desertification, we can address water scarcity, and we can end global hunger. We can do some just really incredible things. And so I, I invite you to read the book. And in that, you'll see that a new way of farming, I believe, is, is the future of farming. And, and we believe we're going to have to start thinking differently about the way we grow our food. There's a lot that we can learn uh, from farmers, not just in Africa, but in, in developing countries around the world. Um, thinking vertically, thinking uh, about how to combine different things in new ways and to integrate things together. Um, you can see in this farm, they've got all kinds of different crops growing together and there's a lot of different in, uh, relationships. So I wish maybe in the, in the things, raise your hand real quick if you garden or you have a garden. Um, I'm assuming there's a lot of hands. I can't even scroll fast enough, you know, to see all of it. Um, well, uh, you know, this farmer has a garden as well, and it's his lifeline. And 
he doesn't have much cash. He can't buy extra inputs. He can't buy extra pesticides. He can't fall back on different things. So when we're working with communities to really optimize, we're coming up with awesome ideas. And when you look at the onions that he's growing here, you'll see in our garden. So one lesson is really how to combine different things. And we do talk about companion planting and hopefully many of you are trying are learning about companion planting. And it's a, it's a stepping stone. And it's something that, you know, traditionally as we think about our gardens around here, people are growing, it's really mini monocultures of sorts. Um, but you can see that not only is this farmer uh, combining different things in different ways because the onions are actually protecting his peppers. He cares more about his peppers and he's gonna make more money off the peppers than he is his onions, but he's got the onion barrier set up because he knows that there's all kinds of insects that are gonna wanna come and attack his peppers. And he's got some other things integrated in. Um, and this is, so that was just companion planting. And that's like, a, that's 101. And this is kind of 102 or 103 level because what we're doing with our farmers really blows some people's minds. And I'm super excited about it. I mean, this is essentially, what is this? This is a tomato garden. This is a cabbage garden. This is the tomato cabbage garden. And then you start looking around and you say, wait, but we got this in there and we got papaya in there. And if you see, so I've got a, a seven part perma garden thing that I'll run through with everybody. And you can even kind of scribble it down. And it's, if, you, if you're doing gardening, it, it gives you some different principles that we've learned and we can't unpack all of them, but I, I think you can see how a lot of them will fit together. And so when we do a garden with our farmers now, and this is what I brought to Maryland, I do in my backyard. And um, first off is food for us, right? So food for us. And so it's whatever you want. Um, and here it might be the tomatoes or it may have been the cabbage, um, but we do food for us. So then we do well food for the soil as well. We don't wanna forget about the soil. So somewhere in this garden are a couple beans and I can't even point them out. It's just a mess to me to tell you the truth. Um, but there's some nitrogen fixing things in there. So we've got food for us, we've got food for the soil. Um, there's flowers. We're always gonna purposely put some flowers in there or something to give food for animals or biodiversity. So something to attract uh, some bees in there. Um, so food for us, food for the soil, food for biodiversity. And then we're gonna steal a little bit more directly from some, some good permagardening principles. And then I say, diggers, standers, climbers, and protectors. And you say, oh my goodness. So a digger is something that goes down in, a sweet potato or a potato, or just something that's gonna crack the surface of this plot here. So even after things kind of get hardened a little bit after a while, you still have something kind of breaking there and helping water go down. You got nutrient transfer and other things happening. Um, a, a, a stander, you've got a papaya, a sunflower, an ochre or something coming up. A climber, something like a pea or a, a cucumber or just something that's going to help you get vertical and then protectors. And there's all kinds of wonderful protectors. Um, some of the protectors, it's nice if you do a whole row of marigold, will we'll protect you know a lot more evenly. Um, but just kind of uh, uh, following the the thing of having some uh, um, some herbs, some some basil, some smelly basil on one end, and some smelly oregano on one end, start to give uh, some more diversity into it um, to the point where. It confuses insects, and when a bug does come, it's not going to take over. It's not going to spread over. There's enough kind of biodiversity in there. And because you're getting vertical with the climbers and the all, you're given little niches for the praying mantis, which doesn't like a monocrop of anything, but the praying mantis likes to kind of perch up on something, and it, it gives little nooks and crannies for all the other beneficial insects in your garden as well. So um, if you want to attract the beneficials besides the flowers, you know, giving them different places to get involved is, is, is important. So, so combining things together, companion planting, perma garden, permanent gardens is important. And um, a second thing uh, that I, I would, I think was just absolutely is so important for us here in, in the US in Maryland and everywhere is nitrogen fixing trees and we have them. We have them, we have, we have a lot of them. We don't use them at all. Not that I know of, you can prove me wrong. Um, so right now in the United States, if we, if we looked at the map, and I didn't include a map, I was, I was thinking about doing one. But if we look, we've got a couple issues that I'll point out very quickly without going too deep. I'm gonna do a quick time check, good. 
Um, we've got the Mississippi watershed draining out and bringing an incredible amount of nitrogen rich stuff, which is really fertilizers and manure. And all of this stuff is coming out into the Gulf of Mexico and creating a dead zone. And that's not something that we want to propagate. It's just getting worse every year. The more we, the more, the more fertilizers we use, the more, the dirtier the livestock industry could be. The Mississippi Delta and all. Every time, it's it's tough. There's a, it's a, it's an ugly system. There's a lot of um, uh, destruction in the ocean and, and dead fish and everything. Well, in Maryland here, we have the same thing. I, I spoke at a museum that isn't far. The Susquehanna River comes down out of Pennsylvania, and you've got a similar effect in the Chesapeake Bay happening. And this is happening everywhere around the world. This is the food system that we're propagating. This is the same food system because a lot of the soy and the maize that's and corn that's grown in these ways is fed, is fed to animals uh, for as, as it becomes livestock feed. And so, you know, we, we all eat all a lot of these products that come out of it. But as you kind of take a step back and you see over time, this cereal and livestock mix is, is gone a bit wrong. When we look at our farmers in Africa, nitrogen fixing trees, rows and rows of trees get rid of the whole fertilizer. You don't need fertilizer. It has a huge carbon footprint. Um, it's expensive. It's usually mined and around the world in different places. And, um, and here we are, we can grow it for free. Uh, I think I've got another, and this is just a different picture in a, in a different field showing something very similar where if we need to produce a lot of food to produce, to, to feed the world, uh, we don't need to keep using more and more agrochemicals. We can use it by feeding soils and improving them by using nitrogen fixing trees. Um, I think you can't, I mean, we're to, well, it's impossible. Everything's either impossible or new or uh, impossible whopper and um, new types of um, alternative, uh, I don't want to say fake meat, but uh, you know, we, we have new types of uh, alternative veggie patties and different things that are coming out. Everybody is very concerned about the impact on not just our planet, but also our health in terms of um, a lot of the uh, um, products and byproducts that come out of the system. So fodder trees are something that we learned in our system. Fodder trees means for every dairy cow you have, rather than buying a, a, a feed that might be maize-based and have a big carbon footprint and, uh, and be farmed on, on you know, areas of land and clearing other forests to feed the, 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 the livestock, fodder trees is something that we've learned about. And that for every head of cattle you have, you can grow 500 trees that feed the, the, the cow or the, the livestock throughout the year. So uh, you can see this family here, they've got fodder trees growing around the, the windbreak. So the fodder trees are protecting their avocados and their other things growing in. And when they need to feed the, the dairy cow, they're just going along the hedge each day and chopping and feeding the stuff fresh directly. The trees then grow all back. They don't have to spend any money on cattle feed ever again. And it's much better for the environment. It's healthier. There's more nutrition in it as well. So we're learning all kinds of really interesting things that farmers around the world could benefit from. Um, I'm sure you're burning with all kinds of questions that, that you'd love to ask. Um, I'm hoping by now you're, you're interested in finding ways to be able to get involved as well. I invite everybody to go to trees.org and to look at our ways to get involved page. There's different ways to give and to support our work as we grow through Amazon Smile, becoming an ambassador, people are donating in all kinds of different ways. So um, we do recognize that it's important to support the, the Sandy Spring Museum and we hope everybody will uh, take a look at, at Trees for the Future as well and go to trees.org and support us. Um, there's some of the, the social media links here, and I might be able to drop some of them into the uh, chat here pretty soon. I don't think I have immediate access to it. Um, but if you take a look at the screen here, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, Twitter, we're on social media. Uh, the website is trees.org, but uh, you're, I invite everybody to follow us and to follow me online. We try to be active and to share stories and pictures of everything we're doing all the time. And I would love to thank everybody. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time and your patience and listening to the story. I'm 
dying to hear what types of questions uh, you may have for me this evening. Thank you. All right, John, I'm gonna jump in here in no particular order. We do have some questions coming in and happy to keep them coming in as time allows. Um, we're gonna wrap up what in about 15 minutes, is that right? Okay, um, I'm gonna start with what I think is a relatively straightforward one. Um, do proceeds from the book plant 50 trees own, do proceeds from the book plant 50 trees only if you buy from Amazon or can you use a different bookseller as well? Uh, if, if, if you pay full price and, and we get the, the full price, um, then wherever you buy it, it it'll, it'll plant the trees. Yep. All right, thank you. Um, uh, I see quite a variation in rainfall water across the different countries you work in. How does your program adapt to the differences? Yeah, the methodology stays the same. You, you know, we, we, we protect fields, we diversify what's inside of the field, um, and we use a lot of the same farming techniques, but you're right, because uh, we prioritize or we try to work in the, in the most dry, arid places. Uh, but we also work on, on humid hillsides in Uganda um, and Kenya. A lot of times we get a lot more rainfall in those places. So we're getting, you know, well over a thousand millimeters. In other places, it's 600, 700 millimeters or something like that. Um, so the species will change a little bit as well. Um, but, um, but the methodology stays the same. And, uh, and even as we enter into new programs, uh, new places, if we start working in Haiti again, if we started working in India again, or if we just started working in a new country in Africa, we, we still really follow the same methodology, the, the same kind of training methodology, training people to you know, figure out what you have, what do you need, what can you sell, and then we go through the step by step. Um, but when they protect their field, it might be just a very different tree species they end up picking uh, in one zone versus the other. So it's good. It's a good question. It needs to adapt to different places uh, yeah, as it as it goes. Um, is forestry always deforestation? In the southern U.S., pine trees are replanted, and it's more like a crop. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, we, you know, even, even in forestry, there's kind of like tree crop, you know, and there's a lot of monocropping in, in forestry. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it, we, we've done, we, we've seen all kinds of things, but it's, it's uh, not really what we do. I don't know if there's more on the question there. All right. I see something uh, about natives, uh, nitrogen fixing. I'll take that quickly. Um, so nitrogen fixing, usually if it has kind of like a bean has a bit of a pod in it, um, oftentimes that's a signal that that tree species is also fixing nitrogen, which means through the roots, it's able to um, um, fix nitrogen into the soil. Um, and so acacia species, so we have a lot of acacia species, which are native in Africa and that are used in the living fences. Um, and uh, there's a couple of fruit trees as well um, that are thorny, and it's nice to have berries in your in your in your in your living fence. So um, yeah, so I, I think the acacia is the biggest one. There's a couple others, but that that's by far going to be the biggest. Yeah, John, I, I think that question is also asking for nitrogen fixing. What suggestions are for local native species to Montgomery County? And is red bud one of those that's nitrogen fixing? Um, uh, um, you know, I think uh, if like a black locust, honey locust, I think you have you might have some luck in 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 those families. Um, I'm not sure um, on on the red bud here. Um, there's something that looks like uh, um, sometimes a lot of the trees that have tiny little leaflets on them. Um, I'm kind of forgetting some of the the names off the top of my head here. Um, but if I remember it again, I'll... I think something like a Kentucky coffee bean would fall into that. I was thinking of a mimosa. Mimosa. Which is invasive, but it's just like that's, but that's, so that's not like the tree to recommend, but some, something, something that's comparable and in that family or something that has those types of properties. Yeah, you'll see it has the right interactions with the roots and, and it does some other good things too. Other question here, how much does it cost to make one forest garden happen in general? Yeah, um, it's, it's hundreds of dollars. Um, we're 
we're, we're, we were budgeting around $600 per forest garden, and it's usually over four years. Uh, we're starting to invest more, um, and it varies just a little bit by, uh, by country as well. In addition to helping farmers grow the forest gardens, we're also building the agroforestry enterprises and, and walking our groups through savings clubs and how to start small businesses. So there's additional things that we keep. Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't quite end. The investment doesn't end. Uh, but to get the forest garden started, yeah, it's somewhere between $600 and $1,000, depending on where we are and, and how big it is. Um, we're finding efficiencies all the time. Um, and uh, it's really kind of part of the strategic plan is more we can find big farmer groups of 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. We're finding efficiencies as we grow. Another similar question related to funding. Do you receive any support from USAID, which is active in, the, in all of the African countries you, messed, you mentioned? Sure, yeah. Uh, we, we're trying. Uh, we, we've got a diverse set of, of support. Um, we get support from individual donors. We have foundations that support us. And we have a lot of uh, business partners too, um, watches and apparel and wine and other companies that sell products and plant trees. Um, USAID as well and other institutions. I, I, we work with the UN, we work with the FAO. Uh, we're trying to work more with USAID. They have funded us in the past to develop out some of the training materials, in fact, uh, that we use the forest garden training program. But uh, we're, looking to, we're looking to do a lot more. And I think we'll be able to over the next year or two. It's a great question. Yeah. Coming back around a little bit to the water resource, um, sure. who pays for the water, your organization or the farmer? And I will add, you know, is the goal sort of a zero scape approach or um, how are they watering to get plants started? Yeah, no, great question. Water is so essential, especially in the arid zones. Uh, if Water is farmer's contribution, uh, but we, we, we meet the farmer where they are. So if they're really off the grid and if they're pulling water from a well that's 100 feet deep, we're not going to recommend oranges. We're not going to get into you know citrus and other things. We're going to be doing guavas or we're going to be doing hardier, hardier trees uh, as, as they progress through the training program. If they do have access to water, then they can, you know, they can get into more like mangoes and citrus and all kinds of fun things as well. So water is a limiting factor, but it doesn't keep you from participating. The main important window is, uh, is that in, in all the communities where we work, there's a distinct rainy season and dry season. And you just need to time it so that for the few months leading up to the rainy season, uh, you have water so you can do a small nursery. You saw the picture a little bit earlier I showed. You don't need a big, uh, a big gigantic nursery. In fact, we try to avoid the big quarter of a million tree nurseries. They're beautiful, but we try to have small ones so that a, a family can get a bucket of water, even if you have to pull it from the well, um, pull it up and you can water it on your, on your nursery and it's not gonna uh, overburden anyone. And you can water it in the morning, you can water it in the evening. And if you can do that, you know, for those, those few months leading up to the rainy season, then as soon as the rains plant, we get those trees planted and hopefully they get enough rain in those first few weeks. Not only do they survive well, but we do not, of all the millions of trees that we plant, we, we're not irrigating trees through the, rain, the dry season. Uh, we're catching enough of the rainy season so that they're able to survive on their own. And um, that, that's important, yeah. Uh, and and in, the, in the species selection and, uh, and the farmers, because it's a forest garden, there's fruits and vegetables growing all around it. They're coming out to the trees and taking care of them all the time as well. So uh, that's all part of the success, yeah. Um. Let's see here. How do you factor traditional farming, ecological knowledge, and local food preference into your programs? What's, uh, yeah, there's, there's wonderful cuisine, uh, local cuisine in, in all the countries where we work. Um, and within the garden, as we do permagarden, we're trying to, in fact, a lot of the landscapes, the varieties are getting lost. Uh, because there's kind of mass monocropping of maize and some of the other uh, main cash crops, uh, the varieties of local species are being lost. Uh, it, it might be eggplant varieties. It's so sad the tamarind was lost from a landscape in Senegal where we're working right now and there's just no reason for it. Uh, but other tomatoes or other greens or other things that people have been eating in the cuisine for many years are oftentimes now being lost. We train every farmer to save seeds. 
We provide a lot of air, uh, open pollinated varieties in order to uh, get more uh, seeds out uh, in saving and, and to build the kind of local seed networks. And um, the, uh, the questions, we always ask questions too. I think that's a, a good part of, of the answer because it's, we, it, we're never prescribed. It's never here's, here's the whole set of trees that we're gonna, we're gonna come in and, and, and you know, kind of push on people or encourage people. It's always questions and it's open-ended questions and people can kind of answer these questions in, in, in very different ways. Um, and so when the family decides, we say, what would you like to eat? Uh, I would encourage everybody out there, in fact, if you scribble down the perma garden, that was good. The rainbow diet, I do this with my own family, my own kids. Every single day we're trying to eat something that's naturally, not artificially, but naturally red, green, if we can get a little purple in there. But the, 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 the colors in a, in a diet are very important. Orange things have vitamin A. Other things that have nice colors in them have a lot of nutrition. And so as we're planning with farmers and, and, and asking questions about uh, culture and cuisine and, and what they want to grow, um, that's another thought process. If we make sure that everybody's growing some orange things and it doesn't matter, you might want to do carrots. She may want to do squash. Somebody else wants to do an orange sweet potato, but we do encourage everybody to have orange things growing all the time and red things growing all the time and, and green things and, and the, the cruciferous are important too. Yeah. Um, this may be our last question and I think it's appropriate to kind of bring it down to our local area. How can we encourage people to give up their acres of mode in parentheses with fossil fuels, the state lawns and reforest their properties instead? And I think that's a local Montgomery County kind of thought challenge. It is, I think though, you know, the whole world is, is facing it. I, I spent a lot of my time critiquing how, like if you fly from coast to coast, the whole world is covered with corn maize and soy, right? Like there's very few species that are causing all of the degradation. And in other regions, there's very, very few species that were growing. It's just, it's the oil palm, it's the cocoa, it's the, um, uh, that, that are causing so much uh, degradation. Um, when you look at grass, it's even more astronomical. And I, I so I, I get it. And I think it, the, the fight that I fight with grass is also, We've got all we got herbicides. We've got all kinds of things being sprayed uh, that we we have no idea what's going on. I've uh, I, I hear the question. I converted my own tiny little eight foot by eight foot front lawn into a perennial herb garden. So I've got a row of rosemary and a row of chives and a row of oregano, which survives the winter in Maryland well. And uh, and I've got another chives and onion chives and garlic and all. So I've you know tried to kind of switch over my own front lawn and. I, I certainly appreciate that as well. Um, it's hard. Uh, I think part of the challenge that we face here in the US and part of the reason why, why answering that question and coming up with something is so tough is that when we look at our food systems around the world, and this very much is awesome because it really does get to some of the essence of the Sandy Spring Museum and some of Allison's initial opening words is that there's very few companies and people who, who hold the power over food systems. Uh, they're usually making their money off of a food system that is, 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 is quite destructive. There's a lot of agrochemicals being used everywhere. And uh, we really need to kind of change, uh, you know, change the power dynamics in food systems and find ways to empower farmers to grow healthy things. Uh, when we're talking about the grass, the lawn, oh my goodness. Uh, I know that we tried to ban certain chemicals on lawns. I know the landscaping companies had you know, found ways to, to bring them back. And, uh, and I think it's a similar fight in our food systems. It's not just you know, those types of agribusinesses that want to sell the seed to all the, the, the lawns of the world, but you've got food people who say, I want to feed the world, but I also want to sell the seed to all the farmers. And I, I think when we have these big agribusinesses and other power 
people who have too much power in these systems, um, it's, it's terrible for the environment. It's usually bad for our health. Um, but when we empower the small guys, when we empower a smallholder family farm, family farms have been decimated across this whole country. But we know we get most of our healthiest food from the local family farms that are feeding us. It's not the big agribusinesses and it's not these other things. So um, dandelions, in my CSA, we, we get dandelion greens and we eat them. They're very nutritious, you know? So um, I, I understand the challenge of lawn care and, and no mow movement and stuff like that. I, I'm, 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 it, 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 it excites me. And I, I, uh, I know that many of you, I, I have many friends in here this evening. I know everybody's kind of fighting their fight to, to fix the food system. What's better for the planet is also better for our health. It seems that healthy food can be grown sustainably and regeneratively. Uh, we can find ways to, to do it. And a lot of the stuff that's not good for us is really um, deteriorating the planet. If you don't know where your, this may be my last point here, Jeff, if you don't know where your food is coming from, it's probably being grown in ways that are causing some type of destruction or impinging on somebody else's uh, happiness someplace else. So I think and getting in tune with your own food chain, uh, figuring out where your food is coming from and making sure that the people who are growing it are growing it in good, important ways. If we all do that, I think we can have a, just a tremendous global change. Um, we, can, we can cut a lot of the agrochemicals. Uh, we can empower family businesses and, um, and if we do the same type of stuff in developing countries, we can end hunger, we can end poverty, and we can end a lot of the forced migration uh, that's happening because people are looking for, for options themselves. So um, thank you for everybody. Thank you for your time and your patience this evening. I invite you to, to follow us online. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Sandy Spring Museum. And thank you, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So we, we always let people hang out for a few minutes in case somebody was too shy to ask you something in the in the chat box. So um, if you guys don't mind just hanging out for a little bit. But thank you everyone for coming. Um, hope to see you at the next happy hour. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Allison. I'm happy to hang around. Sure. So, so John, where were you? I was in the Peace Corps too. I'm wondering if we were served about the oh, same time. I was in Senegal 2001 to 2003. Yeah. I was in Sierra Leone. Oh my gosh. When was I there? 89 to 91, I think. So. Oh, that's waiting? fantastic. Oh, that's, great. <laughs> that's great. Have you been back? No, I haven't. But um, I mean, it, we, we, we got evacuated. I mean, it was right when sure. the civil war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But like life changing experience. No, it was. It was. I encourage it. I, I, I'm encouraging all young people are coming out of college. I'm thinking about going, maybe not guys. If you're thinking about it, just go. Yeah, it. I, <laughs> one toe in there. Just, just go. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'll take a look at, at the messages here online too. And if anybody has a question that they want to ask, uh, you know, they're welcome to, welcome to go away. I do see the question about forest gardens in the U.S. We see the food forest movement, I think, it's a little bit more and it's a little different. It's more kind of growing food in the forest than it is. Um, but no, the agroforestry has been tough here in, in the United States uh, and kind of what I described, I think it has tremendous impact and it could be absolutely wonderful uh, environmentally. And, um, and also we could find ways to help farmers diversify and, and start growing new things, but we, we don't see uh, I know the University of Missouri has an agroforestry program, and I think if we went through there, you might find some more of the agroforestry that I talked about, and maybe some more forest gardens too. There's one uh, forested near Annapolis. Uh, if you go, it's out 50 a little bit from DC. Um, if you go around 495 and you go out forested, he's got a forest garden there. Uh, Lincoln is his name. He's got a wonderful place as well. So uh, you do find them. I think of our, you know, our 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 local family farms have an opportunity to kind of combine and to transition into into forest gardens quite easily. I'd love to see the larger commercial enterprises do this too. We'd be happy to advise for free if they would, you know, take it on. Sure. What other questions do we have here? Mostly people saying thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the kind thanks. No, I appreciate everyone coming here this evening. John, thanks a lot. It's a lot of people really got a lot out of it. And it looks like several people are saying they're 
they're all in buying the book and getting involved. So <laughs> oh, fantastic. No, that's great. Thank you. This was my first happy hour. I enjoyed it and it was nice participating. Thank you. Jeff, thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for all the work you're doing at Ashton Manor. It's interesting to hear about the local restoration efforts and different ways to put things together here is fascinating. Yeah. John, this is Victor. I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, it, your organization sounds really exciting. Um, I just retired from USAID. That's why I asked the USAID oh, question. But I, I'd be glad to um, at least give you some contacts in the organization that um, might be able to help you out. No, we, we appreciate that. I'm, yeah, I'm John at trees.org. So um, if you want to connect with me, we're, uh, we're networking. We're hoping that USAID is going to do some great things in these next couple of years to come. And I, I, hopefully there's some more activity brewing and um, we could, you know, we're looking, looking for opportunities. So they've been uh, supportive of our training programs in the past. We got a TOPS grant, as they call it. Uh, which mm -hmm. was $100,000 to help develop out training materials and programs. And it was very, very instrumental at a key time when we needed it. And then I ran with this program for five years. We collected all this data on it. So it's a good time to go back and to sh show, them what we, show them what we've done and uh, make, make some new friends as well. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that.